right, hello everyone. Uh, we're gonna get started on the core accessibility core conversation and uh, we'll do quick introductions here. Uh, since I'm at the mic, I'll go first. My name is Kristen Pohl. I'm from the US and I am a contributor to Drupal and an agency owner. Yeah, I'm Andrew. I'm one of the core accessibility maintainers. I should come over here to the microphone. Uh, I'm one of the core accessibility maintainers since last year, uh, contributing to accessibility issues for a number of years before that. And I'm uh, Theodore Biadala. I'm a JavaScript maintainer for Drupal. And I work usually on accessibility issue because they have JavaScript problems, usually. All right, so why accessibility? So we pulled this quote from the web. Uh, the power of the web is in its universa universi ah, universality. <laughs> Uh, ac access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an es essential aspect. So this is a quote from the inventor of the web. And I'll let uh, Andrew talk about this. Yeah, so I, I really like this, this word. Barrierfreiheit is a German word. And literally, it means without barriers, barrier-free. And I love this because it's an example where the, the German word in English makes more sense than the English word makes in English. So barrier-free, uh, it's a good one to learn. All right, so our goals today are to learn some of the new things that are happening in accessibility, uh, brainstorm some ideas of how we might implement these things, and then also try to figure out how can we get more people to help. Yeah, so I thought we would just mention a few important things since uh, Drupal 8.0 came out. Um, in the past, uh, my colleague Mike Gifford has uh, talked extensively, blog articles and conference sessions about the, the things we achieved between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. But uh, since Drupal 8, we've kept going. And the biggest, biggest win, I think, is that the inline form errors module is now stable. Uh, so if you haven't experienced it yet, I recommend that you try it. Uh, when you're building websites for clients, I really do recommend that you turn this on on you know, every website that you build. It's a big, big win, and it helps lots of different groups of people. Uh, we're extending the use of some JavaScript features that we put in. Uh, Drupal Announce is a little utility which allows you to make a little custom announcement which a screen reader user can benefit from. Uh, we're extending the use of this now in Drupal core and of course any Drupal module can also use it, uh, use it sparingly. And we've found out, uh, we introduced some keyboard accessibility regressions where um, some things would work with a mouse but would not work with the um, keyboard. And so we have managed to fix a number of those but Importantly, we've managed to build that into the new JavaScript testing framework as well. So we now have some uh, tests in core which explicitly simulate a key press event. So today what we're going to carry on with is look at a few of the things that we could do uh, in the future, uh, sketch out a little bit of a roadmap for where we go next. Now, this one uh, isn't something we could do. This is something we must do. Uh, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines are getting an update. And WebCAG 2.1 is a, a, a significant expansion uh, to WebCAG that brings in, uh, I think, about 20 new success criteria. Um, I've been tracking this since uh, the start of the year. Uh, the W3C is still a working draft. But now is a perfect time to mention it because the working draft milestone this September is the one where they finalized the success criteria that were going to be included. From this point forward, the W3C are refining uh, the, that so they can move it towards the recommendation stage. 
which means it's now the time for us to start looking at Drupal and spinning out issues about this and looking at our core themes, Seven and Bartik in particular, and saying, is there any part of the design there that we need to tighten up? So I've picked out uh, a few examples of what's coming in WebCAG 2.1. Um, one of them is target size, and that refers to uh, things like when you have a mobile phone um, and you're using it with a finger, you might have um, some small targets next to each other and you're using your finger, and you want to make sure that the, the thing is big enough that you don't hit the wrong one accidentally. Now, we address this as part of the mobile initiative, uh, but now it's being formalized in WebCAG, and what we need to do really is just confirm how well we're doing. I, I'm, I'm hopeful on target size we may already hit that. Um, one thing that we're not doing very well on is focus styles, uh, in particular for sighted keyboard users who utterly rely on these. Uh, we, have, we have focus styles, but they, some of them are strong and some of them are far too subtle. Uh, WebCAG 2.1 brings in requirements for the strength of uh, contrast on focus styles. Uh, and there are some other things as well where WebCAG 2.1 will uh, address more kinds of assistive technology. So an example of that is that there are some new success criteria relating to speech control. Um, so yeah, so WebCAG 2.1, that is a must do. And uh, as of last week, the core product, maintain, uh, core product managers for Drupal uh, agreed that this would be a major initiative. We, we really need to do that because uh, Drupal, Drupal is a strong contender for accessibility in the uh, CMS framework area. Uh, I dare say we're actually a leader there and we want to maintain that position. This is something that we could do. Um, this one is the, the W3C ARIA authoring practices. Uh, ARIA is a, a way to en enhance um, HTML with a few things that it's not capable of expressing. Uh, in order to, you know, we, we build, we use HTML and JavaScript to build some interesting interfaces like tabs and accordions and date pickers and mega menus and things like that. And HTML doesn't express those very well, so ARIA lets you uh, build in some additional information which assistive technology can use. An example of that is that in an accordion, uh, some ARIA properties and states can inform a screen reader whether your accordion is open or closed, expanded or collapsed. But they have been um, implemented in a variety of ways, and uh, ARIA is often misunderstood. So the W3C is putting together a, a set of design patterns which ex uh, illustrate some best practices for including ARIA. Now, this will not be a formal recommendation. I think it's just a, a W3C note uh, to, uh, of what you can do. And we don't have to adopt it wholesale. We can look at any of the patterns that are involved there and ask whether it would be a good fit for Drupal. Um, a couple of places I think we should do it are our vertical tabs. Uh, we've had those since Drupal 6, where they began in, in Contrib. And the, they look like tabs, for sure, but they don't behave quite the same as tabs would on a desktop application. So the, the ability to, say, switch tabs using arrow keys, etc. The ARIA authoring practices sort of describe a pattern, and it's a, a kind of an attempt to standardize, uh, um, uh, uh, reach some standard patterns which can be reused across the web. I think vertical tabs is a good one we could use. It will involve rewriting a lot of our JavaScript um, and either up, uh, updating our own JavaScript or maybe throwing it out and looking to see if there's a better piece of JavaScript in a, a third-party library. It even goes as far as um, providing patterns for things like a tree grid widget. And I'm thinking, well, you know, do we have any of those? And uh, should we... Uh, the, the 
And another way of thinking is, let's not use tree grid widgets. <laughs> you know, let's get, get rid of those for usability. So area authoring practices is something I think we can bring into Drupal core um, when we feel it's ready or when we feel we're ready on incremental minor releases. Uh, I'm interested in the media initiative. I, I went to their um, thing that they did yesterday, their state of the media initiative summary talk. And the thing that the media initiative offers us is a way to extend our coverage of the authoring tools accessibility guidelines. These are, uh, this is another W3C standard which uh, describes how uh, an, an authoring tool such as Drupal or WordPress or Microsoft Word or so on uh, can provide features which help you produce content that is accessible. Uh, an example of where Drupal already does that is that for any image field, you can configure whether or not the alt, uh, the, the text alternative field is enabled for that particular image field uh, and whether or not it's required. It gives some flexibility to site builders and information architects, but the goal is to enable you to produce accessible content. Well, at the time Drupal 8 came out, we didn't cover much more media than images. But as the media initiative grows and we want to bring in capabilities for video, then we'd also want to start supporting uh, content authors who are dealing with captions for videos and transcripts and uh, you know, see how we can build those in. Now, I asked the media initiative guys how you would do this and whether it needed to be in the API or whether this was something you would configure using fields. And I think, I think it, it, it'll work. I think what we would probably do is, uh, you know, use some sensible defaults in core, but uh, probably it will be covered in things like handbook pages, document how you set things up for that. Um, testing. Uh, there, there are lots of ways that we can do testing. Um, I've put user testing at the top because if the, in, out of all of the things that Drupal has done for accessibility, conducting tests with real users uh, for accessibility is the biggest gap that we have. Uh, the, for usability, we've conducted a number of uh, formal studies, but for accessibility, we haven't done this yet. Um, I personally am coming from a developer background, and I don't really quite know how to organize this or uh, arrange the tests, design the tests, or, or even recruit testers. Um, so this is something I would really love to have more input from the whole community and uh, people who can take part in, in getting this sort of thing running. Automated tests are things that we keep talking about and haven't put very much in place. Um, the functional JavaScript testing framework is great because we can um, write specific tests for behaviors that we've built. Uh, an example is we included one for that uh, keyboard accessibility regression that we mentioned. But we would also use it for things like uh, when we're making custom screen reader announcements, we're running tests to confirm that the screen reader announcement has been made. Uh, we could start building in tests like when we have a modal dialogue, pressing escape, we expect the dialogue to go away, and we can, we can start building that into functional tests now. Uh, the out-of-the-box experience is underway, and this brings in a new theme, and uh, accessibility review has already started, but we're going incrementally. Uh, and at the moment, the current focus is on getting the colors right, and then we'll move to things like the document outline. And uh, the, the, this was demonstrated in the Dries note yesterday, and it takes the form of a, a, a ready-made website which is featuring cooking recipes. And the content will be displayed in views using uh, display modes for the content types, and so at some stage, the accessibility will look at the templates we're using for uh, and the way we've configured the view modes, where we need to have headings, and so on. But as well as being a, a technical challenge to build the theme, we are also including some specimen content. And because the 
sample website is very image heavy, this means that we need to pay attention to the text alternatives that we include as part of the specimen content. And writing good, out, writing good alt text uh, can be a, a fine art sometimes. It's very easy to write a matter of fact description of an image, but if you want to convey why you have chosen that image, it's like you can, you can do an awful lot just by tweaking the words. Think of when you're trying to compose a tweet and you go, oh yeah, I've made a really, really clever sounding tweet. You can actually treat alt text in that way sometimes and it gets across the, the kind of journalistic um, intent of why that image is there. So what I'm saying is there's a good opportunity for copywriters to get involved. It's a, a creative thing. I'm going to pass over to uh, Theodore now, who'd like to talk to you about how, what it's like when we go about implementing this stuff. Uh, yeah, so it's going to be pretty short because it's not the main topic, but it's uh, still important. So the, what you need to know about uh, the court process is that it's pretty long to get anything done, and especially for uh, accessibility because of a few things. So the process to get an accessibility fix into core is similar to a UX fix. And UX issues usually have a lot of comments because everyone has an opinion. And it's a bit similar with accessibility because, you know, uh, maybe it works for this type of users, but not this one. And there can be a lot of discussion, so it can take some time. Uh, the core committers are not very specialized in accessibility, so sometimes it's hard to make them understand that the fix is good and that it needs to be committed. I mean, not always, but uh, it can happen, especially when JavaScript is involved in that, which is often. Uh, as Andrew said, we lack people to, well, we lack people in the queue to review, test, and make sure that the fix is good. And uh, automated testing is lacking as well because we just started with the JavaScript testing uh, a few months ago. Um, so it can be a lot of work to get anything done, unfortunately. Uh, but there are difficulty level to each issue, uh, accessibility issue uh, that you want to well, fix. So the easy topic are the ones that don't require JavaScript usually because it means you don't need to test it really much. Uh, it just markup or template uh, modifications. So that's fairly easy to, for the committer to approve and get that in. The IR roles, because it's uh, markup as well. And the styling. So, I mean, it can be uh, hard to get, you know, everyone to agree on the right color. <laughs> but uh, it's not technically hard to do. So an easy topic doesn't mean it's a fast fix, but it means it's technically easy to get involved and try to contribute to Drupal core. Uh, we have difficult topic, which are usually when anything JavaScript is involved, so the widget, the drop buttons, models, uh, views UI, that kind of things. Uh, it can be really tricky because we have lots of weird and uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, how do you say that? Inconsistent use of some widgets. Uh, the screen reader feedback, it's a hot topic, so we made an API for that, for Contrib, uh, to help Contrib uh, integrate those kind of uh, fix into their code. Uh, and one thing that I did not really expect <coughs> is that we had a user uh, who was made sick by the tour module because the tour module sometimes scrolls a page in your place, and this scrolling made him you know, uh, kind of sick, have motion sickness. So there are you know, some unexpected things that you need to fix sometimes. And lastly, we have the very, very hard topics, uh, which is always keyboard navigation. Uh, we have some codes in core to help manage the uh, keyboard focus. So you can't focus on all the, all the links on the page, but restrict uh, the focus to some links, for example, in models. Um, and as always, documentation, uh, it's hard because 
uh, <laughs> you need to understand the topic, being able to write in a way that makes sense and is accessible, I mean, for people to understand what you mean, and we lack documentation, especially with the whole uh, framework, uh, JavaScript framework and decoupled uh, discussion that Dries started yesterday. Uh, we need good documentation so that people don't break the accessibility work we've done in Drupal core when they implement their own you know, rendering front end, basically. All right, so we have a lot of fun things we can do and different levels of uh, help that we need. So who can help? Uh, so I've broken this out into different types of involvement that you can have. The, the actual organization whose site you're building, uh, whether it's for your, <clears throat> your company or so, for someone else's, <clears throat> some of the reasons why they might want to be involved um, could be you know, increasing their diversity of their user base or just increasing their user base. And if they're trying to get more people on the site, get more leads, conversion, sales, that kind of thing, then they can get more of that. Uh, supporting people with disabilities within their company itself, so if they have like an intranet or something like that, then that can be useful for them. Uh, they often need to comply with the law, so this will be more relevant um, you know, with uh, government, higher education, but it is increasingly becoming uh, more relevant to all, all sites that are on the web. And ideally, if you're doing it up front, you're going to save time and money rather than trying to add it on later. So some ways they can help, you know, basically um, become involved would be basically learning about accessibility in general, uh, trying to find the right expertise, which can be difficult. But, you know, hopefully in, in outside of Drupal, there are organizations that can help as well and finding developers that are at least familiar with it and or willing to learn about it if they haven't already. And an important one is allowing contributions. So if, if they have developers that are working on a project and they are able to fix something to do with accessibility, allowing that contribution to go back to open source. Um, obviously, they can you know, provide their own time and money. Maybe they have people who can help test um, or they can, you know, provide sponsorship for events such as this. Um, I'm an agency owner, and one of the ways that we, you know, hope to, you know, some of the reasons why we like to be involved in this is attract, attracting good employees, good clients, um, and also it makes it easier for us to sell Drupal if Drupal already has these things baked in. So that if we're trying to do a higher ed project or a government project or someone that cares about accessibility, which should be everybody, but you know, being able to sell it better is a, is a good reason. Uh, you can build things faster if it's already baked in, which is good, and you know, giving back to open source and fostering inclusivity. So how can an agency help make this happen? You know, it's, it's hard, but you can budget time for your employees to have some time to contribute back. Um, you have to factor that in, obviously, to your rates, but um, it is an important thing. Another thing is when you're writing up your contract, you should make sure in the contract you're allowed to give back any patches to open source. Make sure it's actually in your contract when you're ha having that with a client, and then um, most often they'll be fine with it. Occasionally, they might fight back, but um, that is a good thing. So build it into the budget. So up front, you can just say that we're going to try to make sure that you know, this, the site is accessible and that, that you're going to do audits and, and make sure, just make sure that's part of your overall plan. You can advertise it as a service, sponsor events, and run trainings. As a community, there's good reasons why we might want to do this uh, as an individual contributor. We develop our own skills. Uh, we become, you know, more marketable ourselves. It helps us, you know, be more empathetic with our our community, and it helps Drupal stay relevant. You know, if, if we're always trying to make things better with Drupal, then it's going to be more relevant. It's going to be easier to have, you know, it's sustained and, and stay um, 
have a job. <laughs> it's just good. Uh, and then there's always the, the warm fuzzies. So obviously you're here, so I'm kind of preaching to the choir, but you know, educating yourself, learning more, coming to these events. Um, you know, there are lots of chats. There's a lot of resources at the end of these slides that will be available, so you can join the chats. There's sprints on Friday. You can actually go outside of Drupal and learn more there as well. And if possible, try to find a mentor, and you might be able to find that at one of these events or in the chats. Hopefully, the, I know there are some here, there's you know, core leadership as well, and this is a core conversation. So why should core leadership be, uh, should care about this? We want to obviously grow involvement uh, within the community, and we can't do everything. So we need to try to find people who are willing to help. Increasing diversity in terms of contribution is good. Just in general, we get different opinions, and it makes the software better. So, you know, obviously, as leadership, we want to make sure that the project su succeeds. And, you know, as Andrew was saying, you know, we're a leader in this space, and we would like Drupal to be a benchmark so that other projects also use it as a standard. And there's the warm fuzzies. So um, some things that leaders can do to help uh, you know, get more involvement. Find a mentee if you can. Try to reach out to people who are willing to help. Um, write documentation, which we are sorely lacking. And, you know, articles, whatever, give talks, webinars, whatever. Just try to get the word out there because a lot of people don't really know about this space. And um, maybe they've heard the word, but they don't really know what it means. So just trying to educate people is good organize events, tag issues in the issue queue, and help out um, in chat or IRC. So we've actually included um, a large number of resources, and just a shout out to, to Carrie Fisher, who put together most of this list. Um, we've got um, general resources, Drupal resources. These slides will be available. Um, not gonna go over all the resources. Oops, got a bullet that's out of place. Uh, and just to quickly, we'll say some of the other things that are happening this week at DrupalCon. We've got um, some things that happened yesterday. We did have an accessibility boff yesterday, which was really nice, and an out-of-the-box um, boff. Uh, today, there's there are two. Today and tomorrow, we've got uh, two boffs on redesigning the admin UI, and the times are at. 12 today and uh, 1 o'clock tomorrow. And then we've got an uh, accessibility session at 2.15 today. And then we have, there's two tomorrow, um, one at noon and one at 1.35. So, and then sprints on Friday. So if you're around Friday, please come to the sprints. There will be a table for accessibility. And just join. You don't have to code. You don't have to know anything about code. You're welcome to come and participate, help with documentation, with testing, uh, moral support, whatever. So just learning more is good. So at that, we'll open it up. I'll let you. Uh, yeah, so um, this is a core conversation. I think we've uh, still got about half an hour available for questions and ideas. Uh, some of the things we just skipped over very, very briefly, we could go into more detail with. Um, I'm just going to leave that up there. Uh, the, the sessions that are on later, later uh, the Beyond Accessibility Inclusion, I believe that's in the Being Human track, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. I think it's a talk about building culture of accessibility into uh, your organization or, or our community. Um, Everett, uh, a, a former uh, core maintainer for JavaScript, is going to be doing more detail on uh, um, accessibility in JavaScript. Uh, sorry, he's a former accessibility maintainer, but he's going to be talking about the JavaScript. And then Barris is going to be talking about um, you know, how you pitch accessibility to your clients and make them understand the value of it. So we have some questions. Or, or one, really. <laughs> OK. Um, I can ask multiple questions if needed. Oh. Yes. The, from the site building side, or rather using Drupal as a tool to build accessible websites, uh, I frequently run into the question of 
how do we, once we've started building these sites, validate the accessibility of the site once it's underway or worse, completed? And you know, it, it, it's hard to back into that, right? But is there a way, or okay, I, I have two questions. One is, what is a way that could that we could popularize to help ensure that more Drupal sites are built in a consistent, consistently accessible way? And two, how do we, beyond following guidelines, validate that they truly are accessible? How does one do acceptance testing for accessibility, really? Okay, so the, the, we, we talked about this in the BOF session yesterday, that one of the big things that we, uh, we would like to improve is our documentation, especially around what we would recommend for themers and site builders and module developers. You, know, you, know, you could even break it down that way. Beyond that, um, so, so that would be the guidelines part that we could put into place. But the second part of your question is more interesting. How, uh, beyond simply following the guidelines, how do you validate that you're, you're doing well? Um, the important thing with accessibility is it, it happens right at the start. This isn't something you do at the end. Uh, for best success, you know, you need to look at this at the design stage, when you're looking at the graphic design, the, the style guides and choices of colors, uh, to designing your, your site architecture from a, a, you know, like the wireframes and information architecture point of view. All of these things can have a knock-on effect down the line because, you know, they'll dictate your choice of where you put headings and how you lay out your page templates and so on. And so you can start with those, but the important thing is start early and then keep monitoring at kind of each stage through the, the build. So once you've got your wireframes, you'll be looking at, right, so these are tabs, these are accordions, do these tabs behave like tabs or are they just links to other pages and they happen to look like tabs? That'll affect your choices later on when it comes to the front end development. And uh, then if you are further down the line when you're testing it, if those were just a bunch of links that looked like tabs but actually led to other pages, well, that's a fairly easy thing to confirm that they're behaving well. But if you said, no, no, this is tabs that are dynamically updating within the page, you'd, then you'd say, well, that's something we have to test. So, um, a key thing is web developers sometimes like to build really unusual widgets. And so if you've got any unusual widget, you need to say, well, that's something we need defined behavior for. I guess maybe to put more nuance on my question, how do I know if I'm using, if I'm, let's say, I'm testing the accessibility of a component or a page, and I'm reading guidelines and or using um, some testing framework to, to validate the choices I've made. What level of confidence should I have that if I follow these rules and or get a green on a test, that it actually is accessible to a user? Like how, how well do those guidelines map to real world usage? And is, is there a gap there still? Yes, there is a gap there still. That's kind of what the ARIA authoring practices is about because it's, um, um, building a set of patterns that, that are, reflect the common use cases. And uh, the idea is if more developers followed a standard pattern, then the, then the whole web would kind of become more consistent. Mm -hmm. um, the, th the thing about accessibility <laughs> testing is the way that WebCAG is structured is that every success criterion in WebCAG is supposed to be testable. But many people make the mistake of assuming that means automated testing. Uh, and that you can just run it through some uh, checker and see some red, green, pass, fail type things. But the, the testable in WebCAG terms doesn't necessarily mean automated testing. It really means um, human review can confirm that it's behaving. So the way that WebCAG is structured, you, it's, um, it's, if, you, if you admire good hypertext, it's a beautiful document. But um, what that means is some people find it really hard to navigate. But um, imagine it, the WebCAG itself is a really short document, but then it has a large amount of supporting material. And you'll find some documents called um, Understanding WebCAG Success Criterion 
use of colour, whatever. And I'll embarrass myself, that would have been the wrong number. Mm -hmm. uh, and in there, you can, you can find longer explanations, which include scenarios, uh, discussing the kind of um, users and technologies that it's aiming to support. And we'll also finish off with uh, suggesting a list of techniques that you are advised to use because it doesn't say do this, it says these are lots of ways that you can address this problem and they're not all appropriate for every single site. You'll make choices between, um, well, we could use this method or that method. They also have a list of known specific failures which are things that if you've done any of the, if, you, if you've encountered any of these situations, then you've not managed to address it properly. So there are some well-defined failures, um, but every, but there's no clear you have succeeded when you do this. They, the web, the understanding webcag documents. That's the more important one that to to learn to read. That's the one where you get a feel for what's there, and it does suggest approaches for human review on those. And if I, uh, if I may just uh, designate someone to kind of answer. So Vincent, just here, he oversaw the uh, updates of the French government, of the French uh, accessibility guidelines uh, last year or two years ago. So maybe you have some opinions or advice on how to do proper uh, validation and testing? Um, yes, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I think automated testing uh, can't be achieved uh, perfectly. Uh, there's always a gap and uh, maybe one of the best approach is to, to, give, to have automating, automated testing that tells you if it's 100% uh, okay 100% false, and what is in between and what needs, what requires uh, human testing. So there's some tools that can do this. And um, there is also uh, uh, a lot of work that has been done um, on accessibility by the French government, uh, like a, a maybe a simplified uh, referential for testings. And uh, I'm just trying to get in touch with uh, people that can point to the English version of it because there is some things in English and there was work done also on a um, uh, JavaScript library uh, to have uh, examples of uh, how to make uh, an accordion or uh, um, uh, a menu in, in the way it is accessible with Angular, React and some other uh, libraries. So I, I will, I'm gathering now the, where are the links and I will share it later with uh, Theodore, um, so it can be put online. Thank you, and we have a question here. I want to add something. Automated testing is one issue I want to talk about. In in PPP, you can uh, you cannot give the decision to the automated testing program, but you have to check thoroughly what is the result of the testing. And I have to decide myself. And some people want to give the responsibility for testing to the automated tool, but I think this is the wrong way to do it. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. That's the um, accessibility is about people and human testing is always the final uh, um, validation of that. Uh, culturally, if you're doing this, say, in, a, in an organization such as a, uh, an enterprise organization or a, a digital agency, um, it can be a good idea to have an accessibility lead whose role is to provide advice but also to keep mentioning the word accessibility at every stage of the, the process. 
Our next question. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, I'm really happy that the Out of the Box initiative actually not only makes it a really nice thing to look at, but they can also actually have a gold standard on how would an accessible theme look like with the alt text and stuff like that. Um, but within the core development, I'm also wondering whose responsibility is it to make sure we have accessibility and usability? Because in usability, for example, we have issues that are nine years old and are not getting picked up. Um, how are we making sure that this, and we don't even have proper guidelines. We don't have any guidelines on what should be a page, a tab, or a secondary tab. Um, so how we, do we bring these guidelines, not only for usability, but for accessibility within Drupal? Instead of saying, there's a tool here, there's a website there, go check here. Um, how do we bring this as something that we do when we develop core, but also when we develop um, contrib modules? And how do we make sure that this is a responsibility that we make our, when we provide the software for others to build on? How do we make sure that these things are all getting fixed and not waiting for 10 years? Yeah, um, I can't speak for the wider aspects of usability, but um, it, to say that there are issues that have been open for nine years, but we can also look at how many issues have been uh, fixed and changed in the process of nine years. Um, you know, like the, the usability team have gone through several rounds of uh, improvements with real user testing. And, and on accessibility, we went from being a, a project where it was like developers were saying, like, what, what is alt text? Uh, to going through successive versions of Drupal of five, six, seven, eight, where we've gotten better each time. Uh, the low-hanging fruit is now all gone, and now we're on to the polish and the harder topics. How do we um, make it, how do we uh, establish a process or guidelines for core developers, and likewise for contrib? We, we talked about this yesterday in the BOF, it is a gap, and I think we do need to have more we need more handbook pages for site builders and uh, developers, and we need more um, more of that uh, edu I, I, get, I guess we need to yeah, more documentation will fix it. The one I'm not sure about is uh, the business of how do we decide what is a tab and what is a page and, and so on. I'm, I'm not really quite clear on that. I suspect as we go towards more richer JavaScript develop, JavaScript driven front ends, um, the answer will be that we want fewer page reloads as, as in, you know, because it's like go to a next page, go to a next page, go through a confirmation page uh, towards more immediate, richer experiences with, you know, modal dialogues and little immediate notifications and so on. So I think in the future, tab would be the answer rather than page, but it depends what we design. And, and just on the <laughs> overall subject of enforcing accessibility uh, in core, uh, we, we are very bad at making process for non-automated uh, topics, I guess. So coding standards, we are really good at that, but anything else that we can't automatically test, we are very bad. The mentoring aspect is one way we could address this. Um, we would like to have more contributors working on accessibility issues, but uh, one barrier we face is that there is so much manual testing involved and there is a big learning curve for using assistive technologies, uh, especially if you're someone who is uh, uh, not requiring them as part of your everyday life. So. A developer could get involved, someone could get involved in core issues, but if you don't know what the kind of expected keyboard uh, experience is like, or you don't know what makes a good keyboard experience different from a tedious one, um, if you have never used a screen reader before, there's a lot of things you need to learn before you can start uh, contributing effectively. And I think maybe we need to just get more screen reader training for contributors. I was just saying that maybe at, at camps we could actually have training sessions for developers 
on not only how did we break things, but how does these technologies work? Yeah. And actually, yeah. something this is something we need to learn, it, and yeah. we need to see how it works when it works right. Yeah, it takes time to, uh, but yeah, having demonstrations and uh, letting people try it for themselves is a good thing. Last year, um, one of the core committers, um, I think it was um, Chris Silifen, who had, had just become one of the release managers. He was he was a new core committer. He like came up to me afterward after a, a similar session and said, "Have you got some time that you can show me to how to use a screen reader?" And uh, I said, yeah, we'll sit down, we'll get the headphones out, we'll have a play. We jumped through headings and, and he had his first go at a screen reader. And at the time, I didn't realize he was a new core committer. But afterwards, I'm like, that's good. I've got buy-in from the top. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to say one thing about the documentation side. Um, and it, it's a little bit telling. So we're putting together the slides and there was a there's a page on Drupal.org for the D7 list of like contributed modules for accessibility. And we're like, well where's the D8 one? And there wasn't one. And we're all looking at each other, well who do we how do we get that added? Like, well, yeah. And so we're all looking at each other like, well, we're not sure the best way to get it added. So we we're like, okay, we'll just make a good quick blog post and put them there, and then once we figure out how to add it, then we'll go and add it. That's kind of sad <laughs> that we're just kind of, well, we need some documentation, and we don't even know, like, where's the right start. So we need, you know, we definitely need to educate ourselves of, like, what is the right process? How can we have, like, our own place and, and be effective at adding the documentation that we need? I think we've got 10 more minutes uh, available to us, so should we move to the next questioner? Hi, thanks for having this core conversation. Um, I just had a follow-up to David's point. I don't think that um, we're ever really, I'm a developer and we're never really done with accessibility. Like we will, we have our designers who will do their style guide and those past tests that they do, but then when we start developing, um, we try to, follow guidelines and then we'll get feedback that such and such doesn't work. So in applying this to core with ARIA roles or redoing the form system, I think we'll just have to, con we can try to do as much automated testing as possible, but we're also going to have to do a lot of manual testing. And as new patches keep going in, we'll have to test again. And like, as something gets refactored, we'll have to test again. Because that's the only real way to know that everything is still working. And I don't have an idea of how to get that manual testing in as part of the process. But I know from working on our client sites that that's really the only way you get to a place where your stuff is working. Yeah. Uh, actually, just I had the question for you: Is uh, when you implement the website, which ki what kind of resources are the most helpful to make sure it's accessible for you? Like, is it actual testing from a professional, or is it documentation, or what kind of things? Um, so the agency I work for, we have a set of documentation internally mm. that we use that are our standards. Um, Specifically for a client that I was working on, uh, they were required by the government to follow the standards. So they had a professional accessibility expert right. go through a key pages and give us feedback that we then had to fix. But for uh, me, I will read the, um, the actual recommendations and right. notes. Um, it is hard to follow at times, because it can be verbose, but I think the more detail, the better. And then I think it would be helpful for Drupal specifically to have examples, because we do have a lot of widgets and interfaces that then when we're impl or sorry, implementing um, client sites or new modules that we could just pull from that instead of continuing to reinvent the wheel. Something I want to highlight in what you said was that uh, you mentioned that your agency actually has a set of internal resources and you're doing a client project where they brought in an accessibility tester. Uh, you know, uh, di digital agencies are notoriously um, bad at 
web accessibility, many of them have never really made it part of their process. So in a way, you're kind of already in the top tier. <laughs> um, but you, you mentioned that you had some testing from a, an external tester. And the, the interesting thing is, when was that done? Was it after you'd done all your, your website build? Or did they come in and uh, get a chance to look at prototypes uh, along the way, which would be, the point I'm making is that this would be earlier feedback, would mean that uh, there's less for you to unpick and rebuild. Um, that I can't speak to because I came into the project after it was built, and I'm assuming that they, even though it would have been nice to have multiple rounds, that they didn't have that testing done until after the site had launched, and then got feedback that they needed to make changes, and that's where we were come, we came in to make those changes and fixes. Yeah. Um, where, where that relates to core as well, I, I mentioned that, that lots of people, uh, core contributors may uh, have, face a big learning curve with using assistive technologies or, or testing for um, different interaction styles. But it's not just the uh, people who are implementing patches that face that. If someone wants to come along and review a patch, they need to have the same level of knowledge. Um, it I think it's like maybe having at a, a sprint, mm -hmm. that could be something that people can, there could be a table and people could learn about this, you know, actually learn some of the tools in order to do the screen readers or other assistive technology. And we could do that this week. We could do that on Friday. We could, uh, let's have a little um, boff during sprint time where people can experience some assistive technologies for the first time and take that first step up that ladder. I'll actually be at the sprints on Friday and have um, local setup. So I'd be happy to show people if you're going to come to sprints on Friday, which everyone should. Let's connect at the end Thanks. then. Thank you. Uh, on one of the slides previously, you mentioned that needs tests can kill an issue progress. Yeah. And uh, at Dev Days earlier this year, I hadn't learned how to use a screen reader up until then, and it had really opened the process for me to. Sure. I think you need to be very close to the mic. At to get Dev Days earlier this year, I hadn't learned how to use a screen reader until the conference like was basically almost over and it enabled me to work through more issues that felt stalled at needs review um, but I am interested in trying to figure out what other things we can do to, to help people like move issues forward and how we can make needs review not like kill an issue or kill a progress on an issue or so they don't last for like 10 years or something like this. Yeah, some of this doesn't relate specifically to accessibility, but it's a general problem in, in core development is that um, an, an issue can be filed and it has its issue summary, then it gets, you know, uh, 50, 100 comments. And in order to move that issue along, you've got to understand what the current state is and the, that involves reading the whole thing. And the, 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 introduction, the introductory summary has not been updated for a while. So that's a, a thing that we share with every other aspect of core development. But for testing in particular or, or what needs to be implemented, um, I've started to, um, as a maintainer, I'm trying to find new contributors and uh, encourage them to get involved. And I realize that means having to teach people what it is. And rather than try and fix accessibility issues myself, I want to uh, present them in a way that other people can learn by fixing them. And I think the effort, we, we need to make more of an effort to have better uh, issue summaries uh, describing accessible behavior and uh, or linking to an issue where we've uh, fixed it somewhere else first, um, or you know, saying, well, we've already got one place where we do this in core, but we need to extend coverage, so refer to this and uh, copy the pattern there. Um, actually putting more detailed instructions in the proposed resolution. You know, what are you actually going to awesome. do? Uh, but it, it does, whoever's updating those issues needs more, uh, needs an awareness of yeah. what's going on. 
And if you're coming to the sprints on Friday, I'll be running the JavaScript table uh, and first time contributor stuff. So awesome. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, how much time do I have? Uh, we have a few minutes left, so maybe we'll say this will be the last it's question. Not a question. It's sharing some resources. My name is Holing Poon, and I work for the New York Public Library. I am a backend developer. We have been learning the hard way of how to make our website more accessible. So we have a design toolkit, NYPL design toolkit. I just put it on the phone. It is available on GitHub. It is our web style guide with accessibility notes embedded in each one of the issues that we have. And we've been trying to um, follow it. This is like our new guideline to our web standards. Um, it follows closely of WebCAG. It's like a non-exhaustive subset of WebCAG um, of things that we want to address first because this, it's so deep and there's so many things that we need to address. Uh, we also do user testing. Right now, every other month, we have a library dedicated to Braille and talking books. So we have visually in, impaired users that would volunteer to do testing for us. So it's not just us checking manually with the screen readers, basically JAWS on Windows and um, VoiceOver on Mac. Uh, we also do like real user testing and get feedback from them. So uh, for what it's worth, um, there's somebody out there doing this. Um, but we're still pretty short staffed. But once accessibility comes in, it's just suddenly that, that there's not enough time and not enough resources to do everything. So we're doing what we can. Thank you very much. We should definitely uh, follow up on this afterwards. And um, one of the great things about issue queues now, uh, the, the way that core development happens is a lot of opportunity for organizations to take credit on fixing issues. And it'd be great to have a, a New York Public Library on our <laughs> list of organizations. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I had a super short question. Um, you talked about the gap between uh, what automated accessibility testing can catch and, and what problems they, they can catch and what a, a, a real person uh, can catch as far as accessibility problems. Um, what percentage do you think that the, the automated tests are capable of, of catching compared to the, a real person? It's growing in coverage. It used to be that uh, accessibility tools were like checking the HTML source. But now the emphasis is on checking the uh, DOM after it's been processed and you've got all the CSS and the JavaScript in place. So you might well have a, a form label in the HTML, but then your CSS has made it invisible in a way that, you know, the, the display none gun, we call it, you know, and you, you, you just shot down a really useful feature. Um, uh, testing tools that go against the DOM are getting a wider range of um, tests. You know, the number of tests are growing because what they're doing is, um, you see this in the, the Tenon and the um, Axe Core um, libraries where you, you, know, you can configure which tests you want to run and some of them are getting towards not, not just, say, HTML validation and stuff, but are actually now looking for common patterns or anti-patterns in what they're testing. Um, and, and you may well have one of those where you, where you say, ah, oh, that's going to throw up a red herring, but we'll say, right, that's fine, we won't run that test on this scenario. So they are getting more coverage, and they are getting... Um, they're getting richer. Uh, how much coverage as a percent, and does this let us off human review? It doesn't let us off human review, but... Um, the, I guess. And, and the, the, there is there is a thing there is a, a, a an idea which said let's get as much of the automated testing involved because once it's in place we just let it go. Yeah, yeah. But um. But what kind of scale are we talking? About? I mean, is it like it'll catch like five percent, or is it like ninety percent of the problems? <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know if that test was 
room around the stage, so we packed even more. I, th I think I know what yeah. Carrie's talking about. Is this the stuff that the, the UK GDS did? Yeah, the UK GDS has done uh, sort of comparisons of, of what, what is caught on deliberately bad pages. Um, years ago, the W3C had a, uh, it's probably still there, had a, a before and after. It's the same website, but coded badly and coded well. And uh, as, as a learning guide, inspect this. Um, be interesting to run the tests against that. Yeah, the, the GDS did write a blog about it, and I think it might be might have been about six months ago. Yeah, we can post that link yeah. along with this as well. We'll find that. <laughs> Uh, and speaking about posting, uh, Vincent just, just uh, tweeted the link to the French resources about accessibility. So you can check the, the hashtag. Yeah. So for the yeah. video, since you were off mic, <laughs> it was 30 to 40 percent of automated test catch. Yeah, Carrie uh, mentioned that the GDS had done a test where they ran lots of tools against a page that was deliberately bad and they they est they estimated that about 30 to 40 percent of the problems that they had deliberately built were caught yeah. cool that brings us to the end of this conversation so I want to thank you all for attending and anyone who wants to get involved in uh, Drupal core accessibility we <coughs> We're seeing more and more involvement at sprints, and the Slack channel, the, the Drupal Slack team, there has a, an accessibility channel. It's really good because we've seen with it, within a few weeks of having that channel, we saw more chat and discussion than we saw in like ten years of using IRC. <laughs> so it's it's there there is there is a, a culture growing. There is a we have a posse. Yeah. <laughs> All right.